All right. Well, thanks everybody again for being with us tonight. We have an awesome show for you. Our next President's Forum tonight is with our awesome guest, Dan Grunfeld. Dan is the author of By the Grace of the Game, and he is also a Maccabi USA alum of the 2009 Maccabia. He was on the Open Men's Basketball team winning a gold medal. So we'll be hearing more about his basketball career, his Maccabia experience, and his book tonight. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to our host, President Jeff Buchans. Thank you, Steve. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, Dan. Uh, as you know, we haven't seen each other in a while. Uh, we've been winding down a little bit our at-home uh, program as we get ready for the Maccabia, where we hope to have 12, 1300 uh, size delegation going this July. Um, and I sort of said to Steve, I said, before we have another president's form, it's got to be something really interesting. And Steve uh, came up with Dan, and that's that's terrific. So I hope everyone had a happy Thanksgiving, a happy Hanukkah, getting ready for the new year. And with that, I'd like to say, Dan, welcome to the President's Forum. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined. I see many friendly faces, Ami Munson, my good friend, and I think I have several other teammates who are here. So it's just wonderful to be with the community. Thanks, Dan. So um, I, th I think we said the last time we spoke, I grew up in the same community and went to the same high school as your father in Forest Hills, New York. Tell us about your upbringing, where you grew up, and what your Jewish upbringing was like. Absolutely. So I was born in the suburbs outside of New York City, so in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. Uh, my birth was literally planned around the NBA basketball calendar, and so my dad had two road trips, and so he took one road trip. My birth was induced. He took another road trip, and he was home in time for my bris. So in, uh, I was really born around the two core forces of my life, Judaism and basketball, and you know, having, you know, my dad was an NBA player, and then he was an NBA executive. So really ha had such an awesome childhood, just growing up around NBA teams and in NBA locker rooms, you know, rooting for the New York Knicks. Jeff, as you and I talked about, there's also pressure associated with that. You know, when you have a, a dad who's very good at the thing you want to be very good at, I write about that pretty honestly in my book. And also, you know, I, I grew up so differently than the rest of my family, right? My dad being the son of Holocaust survivors, my grandparents, of course, surviving the war. And so you know, all the grandparents and parents, they always want their kids and grandkids to have it better, you know, and, and I was, I was able to, to have it better. And so, uh, yeah, for, in, in a lot of ways, I had a very charmed childhood. So Dan, when I was growing up, my father, Dan, also Dan, was a four-time Olympic fencer. And I just grew up in this world where he never pushed me, but I knew I had to follow in his footsteps. It was something I had to do. It was a, a, a path that was destined to fail. There's no way I could have done what he did. Tell me about how that pressure was for you did you embark on it on your own? Did your dad, dad push you a little? How did it happen? I definitely embarked on it on my own. My parents were very thoughtful. They always said, you know, explore your passions, find what you love to do and do it. It could be basketball, it could be soccer, it could be the arts, whatever it is, you know, carve your own path. But what kid doesn't want to be like his dad? You know, particularly when his dad, like my dad was an NBA player and he was an NBA executive, you know, it, it, it was a cool thing. And so I really gravitated towards the game. And while it wasn't forced upon me, I, I internalized a lot of the pressure that I felt from other people, you know, because when you play the game that your dad plays and that he's very good at, yeah, there, there's a lot of pressure associated with that and a lot of eyeballs. And again, I write about it very honestly in my book. I mean, I had a nervous tick in my eyes about when I was eight years old, just because I, I felt this pressure. And not only was it the expectations of being good at basketball, but also I knew what my family had been through, you know, my grandparents being Holocaust survivors, my dad coming to America as an immigrant. So for me, making something of myself through basketball really meant a whole lot. And, uh, but I'm just grateful to have had really loving, supportive, wonderful parents who didn't force it on me because I certainly made it easier, although it was never that easy on me. So tell me about, tell us about your basketball path. Like how old were you when you started playing? How old were you when you realized that you were going to be pretty good? You know, when, when did it evolve? From the time I can remember, I was playing basketball. As I said, I was born, I literally was born into it. It's always what I, what I did. It's funny you asked how old was I when I realized I was pretty good. It didn't even matter because it was what I was going to do. You know, so it was almost like good or not good, here I come. Uh, so I never even thought about it in terms of how good am I or how good aren't I. I just, it's what I wanted to do. So, I mean, I grew up memorizing stats off of basketball cards. Of course, I had amazing access with my dad being the GM of the Knicks. So we would go to practices and I'd be asking Patrick Ewing and John Starks, you know, for pointers and 
challenging them to games of games of horse and, and things like that. But, you know, I, I, you know, as I got grew, grew up, you know, got older, I realized that I had some ability with it and I really applied myself. And I learned that from my dad. I'm, I'm, I write a lot about privilege in my book and I'm privileged in a lot of ways. And one of them is that I had such a good role model of what it takes, you know, because when you really can see behind the scenes of what it takes to, to, be great at something and to try to be great at something, it's a big advantage. So my dad really taught me how to work, taught me how to approach it. And so from the time I can remember, you know, I, I was very serious about the game. Tell me how your game was similar to your dad's and how it wasn't. I write this in the book. We played Louisville my junior year in college and I was having a very good year. And Rick Patino, who worked with my dad with the Knicks, they were both coaches, uh, he, you know, he was the head coach of Louisville. He pulled me close after, after we shook hands after the game. And he said, Danny, I've never seen a son play as much like his dad as you play like yours. And by the way, that was the peak of my college career. I mean, it was early in the season, but I was averaging 20 points and close to 10 rebounds, which those, both those things came down. I finished that year, I was about 18 points and five and a half rebounds, but I was, I had really hit my peak. And that's, I think that's why he compared me to my dad, right? Because my dad was such a dominant player. Uh, I was a, my dad was more physical than me. I was a very physical basketball player, but my dad was just an, an absolute bulldog of uh, physically punishing, played a lot on the inside, really, really great mid-range jump shot, tenacious. I, I also had a, a fair level of tenacity, but I was a little bit more perimeter oriented. I uh, shot it from deep a little more, although back in his day, the three-point shot wasn't prioritized as much. Um, so we both think we're better athletes than we were. So I could say mm -hmm. I might have been a better athlete than him, but he'd probably say he's a better athlete than me. <laughs> we both were just average athletes anyway at the end of the day. But uh, I think there were a lot of similarities to the way we play, but also some differences. How tall was your dad? How tall were you? My dad at his playing days was six foot six. And in my playing days, I was six foot six. I was, the, the big difference is that my dad in high school was about 6'5", 225. And as a pro, I was about 6'6", 215, 220. So I was, you know, I was well built and physical and strong, but my dad's build, and this is, again, something I write in the book, my dad took an official visit to Notre Dame when he was in college and he met Ara Parsegian, the head football coach, and he just took one look at my dad. He said, come play football for the Irish too. He goes, no, no questions asked, you know, and my dad was from Europe, you know, he, football for him was soccer. So he just, he smiled and nodded, you know, he went to Tennessee and it all worked out, but uh, yeah, he was just such a big, imposing, bruising physical force, you know, his legs and his butt. I, I didn't have that. Although again, I was big and strong in my own right, but not like that. So let's just back up a little bit. Did you play in Franklin Lakes high school? Where did, what did, you, did you play in high school? Yeah, of course. So I played at Ramapo High School Ramapo. for a year, my freshman year. But then my dad was fired by the New York Knicks in 1999 and was quickly hired by the Milwaukee Bucks. And so I went to high school in Milwaukee, which may seem random for a kid from New Jersey. But my mom is born and raised in Milwaukee. And that's where my parents met when my dad was drafted by the Bucks. So we used to spend all our summers there as a family. So I knew Milwaukee very well. And uh, I did three years of high school at Nicolay High School in Milwaukee. And Amazing, amazing public high school. I don't think I would have gotten to Stanford if I had not gone to Nicolet. And I wanted to play basketball at Stanford since I was in seventh grade. So that wasn't something that I just stumbled upon. And again, this is all detailed in my book. You know, my grandmother lived 25 minutes from campus in the Bay Area. And we visited with my sister when I was young. And I said, top school, top program, close to my grandma, great weather. This is where I want to go. And so, uh, you know, it, it worked out for me, but I think moving to Milwaukee, what was a big part of that? How about the recruiting process? Was it overwhelming for you? It wasn't overwhelming because I, my dad had been through it. And, you know, it's funny because it was overwhelming for my dad and his family because they didn't even know hardly what college was or college basketball. And, you know, my grandma still tells stories about cleaning the apartment on Sundays and there'd be a knock at the door. And, you know, it's, it's the whole coaching staff from the University of Kentucky. They say, hey, we're just in the neighborhood. We want to thought we'd drop by, you know. And so they didn't know what it meant. So for them, it was overwhelming. I had, I had such great, you know, example from my dad and those experiences. And so, and, and since I was so hell bent on going to Stanford, it really narrowed my priorities. You know, I was recruited by many schools and I would get mail and 
you know, when scholarship offers started coming, that was very cool and exciting. But my parents can tell you, and I know some of my teammates, I think are on the call. I've, I have a pretty high level focus. And so uh, I was just really focused on what I wanted. And I think that kept me kind of grounded and, and my eyes on the prize recruiting wise. I will say that, but I think both my parents, alma maters were in the conversation because my mom went to the University of Wisconsin and I was, you know, in Milwaukee. And so Bo Ryan and his staff, I really appreciated. And then the University of Tennessee, where my dad played, you know, Buzz Peterson, I would, you know, get a FedEx every day from him, you know, with a really nice note. And the nostalgia of it all kind of uh, was intriguing. But my dad said to me, hey, man, if you pick Tennessee over Stanford, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> so How about uh, that? that? Yeah, even though, even though he loves the balls, as do I, but he, he knew I wanted to go to Stanford, and that, that's, uh, that's how it worked out. Well, that's great that it worked out. So tell us about some of your greatest memories of Stanford playing ball. Oh, wow, yeah. So, you know, I was lucky that we had such a good program. You know, my freshman year, we were a four seed in the NCAA tournament. My sophomore year, we were the number one team in the country. We started the season 26-0. and 0. So think, think about that. That's in the Pac-10, where for the University of Arizona – their starting lineup, Andre Iguodala, Channing Fry, Hassan Adams, Salim Stoudemire, Mustafa Shakur. These are five NBA players. Uh, our team at Stanford, we had Josh Childress, who was an NBA lotter lottery pick, but then a bunch of role players, uh, really, really good players. And yeah, we, we didn't lose until March. And so one of my best memories from that year was, uh, it was actually my 20th birthday and we were 19 and 0 and we were playing Arizona at home. We were ranked number two in the country at that point in time. Tiger Woods was sitting courtside, you know, Dick Vitale was announcing the game and we won that game on a 35 foot shot at the buzzer that my, uh, my teammate hit. And if anyone is interested, you can go on YouTube and, and type in the miracle at Maples. You could watch it. Uh, you'll see number 20, who's me sitting on the bench and jumping up and down and being the first to run onto the pile. I wasn't known for my speed, but I don't think I ever ran as fast to run on the pile when, when that shot went through the hoop. But uh, listen, I had, a lot of great memories there, you know, uh, big games that I had personally, big wins that our team had. I had a lot of disappointments, you know, that, that year when we were a number one seed in the NCAA tournament, I missed the shot at the buzzer that would have tied a game. So we were upset in the second round, you know, and again, this is all detailed in my book, you know, the ups and downs, and this is kind of what, what sports is all about. Wow. So after college, well, that's some great stuff. After college, you went on a different path than your dad did. You went for almost 10 seasons throughout Europe and Israel. Tell us how that happened. I will very quickly about Stanford. Probably the most important thing that I didn't mention is my grandmother came to every single home game I played, every single one. Uh, on Sunday, she picked up my dirty laundry, dropped off my clean laundry, stocked my fridge. I'm sure you know there are a lot of Jewish grandmothers in, in our lives, right? So we know that, that type of treatment. And that was probably the most special thing, honestly, to be able to you know, to, to walk that journey with her was, was amazing. And she's 96 years old today, still lives 25 minutes from me and my wife in the Bay area, still cooks us big feasts. She's doing amazing. Oh, that's uh, tremendous. So yeah, my journey was different. I wanted, of course, to play in the NBA. I had a very bad knee injury my junior year, you know, not long after Rick Pitino paid me that really nice compliment when my star was on the rise and, you know, kind of altered my trajectory, but you know, wouldn't trade it, you know, and I uh, played a year in Germany, three in Spain, and four in Israel. And something that folks on this call will probably appreciate, I write in my book, and this is the, the honest truth, I'm probably the only professional basketball player who had to call his grandma to ask permission to sign his first contract because it was mm -hmm. in Germany. You know, and my agent said, you know, I have a great opportunity for you in Germany to start your career. I said, well, let me call my grandma, you know, because obviously, you know, she's a Holocaust survivor, as is my grandfather. She lost seven immediate family members in the war. My grandfather lost everyone. And so I remember asking, you know, telling my grandma, you know, my first opportunities in Germany, and I thought it might be a problem. And she said, sons are not responsible for the sins of their fathers, you know, which is something I'll never forget. She said she, she'll, she won't forgive that her generation of Germans for what they did, but she'll never blame this generation because that's what people have done to Jews across history is blame, blame, blame us for things. And so, yeah, she gave me, you know, her blessing to go play there. And I had a great experience, worked out well basketball wise and, you know, finished my career in Israel, you know, so that was kind of, and of course the, the Maccabee games were, were core to that. And I write very candidly in my book about my experience, 2009 Maccabi, you know, winning gold under Bruce Pearl, um, Ami Munson, of course, being kind of the shepherding the whole delegation there. It was just really a life-changing experience. And I, that's not hyperbole. It was to be in Israel. That was my first time to tour Israel, to compete, 
with Jews from around the country against Jews around the world is something I'll never forget. You know, Dan, it's interesting that that hit home with me, even though I was trying to follow in my dad's footsteps too. My mom, Alice, my late mom was a Holocaust survivor. And my first world championship fencing refereeing assignment was in Germany. And I remember wow. going, I, I remember calling to ask her, are you okay with this? It was very, very interesting. I got, I got similar, very similar response. So let's just back up for a second. Um, to the, tell us what the experience in Israel was like. Um, we've had Maccabea athletes wind up playing there in, in different sports. And tell us what advice you'd give for some aspiring athletes to get to that level where they could play in Israel or maybe Europe. I'll, so I'll talk first about my experience. I, I had a wonderful experience in Israel on and off the court. I, I loved playing there. It's a good league. The pace is nice. You know, I, I came from Spain where we practiced twice a day and you know, my body, I, I basically had to drag myself to Israel for my next job. My body was so beat up and Israel was, you know, more manageable, again, competitive, passionate about the game, but off the court was so meaningful. And, you know, again, this is all in my book, but my family after the war and my dad, you know, growing up in, in Romania under communism, they fled as refugees and they were bound for Israel. They had passports to go to Israel. And at the last minute, they were able to, to come to the United States. But the majority of my family settled in Israel. And it really was the state of Israel who opened up its arms to Holocaust survivors and their families after the war. And so I was able to play in front of my cousins and reconnect with my family, reconnect with many parts of our history, eat amazing food, tour amazing historical sites. I mean, and again, I write this so honestly in the book that as soon as I stepped off the plane for the first time for the Maccabee games, I felt it in the air. I really did. And there was something so profound about being in Israel. And I felt that throughout my time there. And, you know, I, I was played two years in Jerusalem. And so, you know, my dad, he finished his career with the Knicks and he wore number 18. And of course, we all know, you know, the, the symbolism of that number in Judaism, I was able to play for, you know, with Jerusalem across my chest, you know, and so for a family to survive the Holocaust and to find basketball and to have, have it be that intertwined with, with Judaism and with the state of Israel was, was so meaningful. And so, the advice I'd give to other athletes is, first of all, go for it, you know, do it, whether it's Israel or elsewhere, but to be able to, pl to play the sport you love at a high level is a wonderful thing to be able to do. To do it in Israel is great, whether you're Jewish or not. I think, you know, there's so much to learn in Israel. There's so much to love about the country. I think particularly if you're Jewish and a Jewish American, it, it, it's an unforgettable experience. You know, you, you connect with the Jewish homeland, you meet people from around the world who have similar backgrounds as you do. And so I, uh, I always tell people playing the Maccabea games, playing Israel, if you have the opportunity, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Well, that's terrific. So let's transition into the reason, main reason you're here tonight. Let's talk about your new book, which launched uh, two weeks ago by the grace of the game. And I see Pete Kessel already asked the question, when did you first start contemplating writing this book? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so I've always loved to write and love to tell stories. And so I was, when I was playing pro basketball, I had contributing writing positions to several websites and, you know, I'd done well with my writing and it was always just something I loved to do. And as I got older, really started to understand my family story to appreciate the role that basketball played. I, it just dawned on me that this is my white whale, you know, this is the story. There's only one of these. And so once I retired and I went to business school at Stanford, I had a little space to explore my other interests. And I remember telling my wife, it's time, you know, it's time for me to tell this story and to, I think it's a universal story, even though of course not many families have had that experience of surviving the Holocaust and then playing in the NBA. In fact, none have because my dad's literally the only player, but it's relatable and it's a human story. You know, it's a story of perseverance and survival and love and legacy. And I just thought that, it's important for us, but it also might be important for other people to, and, you know, as a source of hope and inspiration. And so, yeah, it was really when I retired from playing and had that space, I said, I'm going to write this thing. And so I did a year and a half of research, uh, interviewing my dad, interviewing my grandmother before I started the writing process, which my first draft was done in eight months. And I woke up at 6.02 in the morning every day for eight months to do it. And at the end of that period, you know, my wife told me how proud of me she was, which I appreciated. But I told her honestly that really the only thing I did was I had the discipline to get my butt out of bed every single morning. And I had that because of basketball. You know, that's what I had done as a basketball player. And so uh, that was I, I started the journey more than five years ago. And it's two years, uh, two weeks to the day 
that my book came out. I'll hold it up for you. You know, I'm very proud of it. I think it looks good. Um, and, you know, it's called By the Grace of the Game. And I think as we continue to talk about my family story and understand where we started, where we ended up in the role basketball played, you'll understand why we titled it that. So tell us about why we titled it that. I just always had this profound sense of, of what basketball had done for us and that the game in, in so many ways was heaven sent for my family. And so, you know, again, my grandparents surviving the war, my dad fleeing communism as a refugee, coming to the United States of America at nine years old, having never touched a basketball, not speaking a word of English. Uh, my dad had an older brother who was eight years older than him and my, their native language is Hungarian. And my dad called him something in Hungarian that translates in English to my king. That's how much my dad revered and loved his older brother. He was diagnosed with leukemia almost immediately upon arrival in the United States. And he passed away within a year. And I'm named after my uncle. My middle name is Leslie. My uncle's name was Lutzi in Hungarian, but Leslie in English. And so my dad, you know, my grandparents, after having lost so much family, lose his son, my dad loses his brother. He went to the playground in New York City in Forest Hills, you know, to make friends, to learn English and to heal from that loss. And he started playing basketball. And roughly a decade later, he was standing on the podium as a gold medalist for the United States. Right. So, again, I'll hold up the book. You could see the title. It, it speaks for itself. Right. Once you know that history for a game to kind of appear, you know, and, and we also talked about the pressure I felt and the expectations. You know, I always kind of had my sights set on my goals with basketball for my dad and for my family, there, there were no dreams yet, right? It was just a matter of survival, but then the game came along. And it, so for all those reasons, it was something that really was sent for heaven. And that's why I think we landed on the right title. And I'll give my wife, Sam, credit because she thought of it. So it must have been very emotional, right? Going through this whole family history and writing this book. Tell us about some of the emotions that you encountered along the way. Very emotional on both sides. Moments of great sadness and sorrow, but moments of great joy and happiness. Because you know, as I'm writing these moments in history, I'm almost sitting inside of them. You know, so to, you know, my grand, my great grandparents being killed in Auschwitz, and my uncle passing away. Uh, you know, those are those are things. You know, there were tears shed because it was it's just such such an emotional story and so meaningful and deep for my family. But then my dad finding basketball and becoming a phenomenon and. You know, a lot of people know my dad as an NBA player and executive, and he was a good, solid NBA player, and he was a very successful NBA executive, but he was a phenomenon in high school and college. I mean, a superstar. And so his ascension was so, so fast and so furious uh, to be able to relive that. And, you know, I had so many conversations with people who saw it and who could comment on it. There was a lot of joy there. And there's a lot of laughter in my book. There's a lot of humor. There's a lot of levity because life is that way. You know, it's joy and it's pain, it's tragedy and it's triumph. And I really learned that from my grandma. I tried to reflect it in the book. And I certainly felt that range of emotions when I was writing it. So when you look back at your career, like you can't compare it to your dad's, but do you look at yourself as having overachieved in your sport and accomplished everything you wanted to do? Was there something that you wanted to do that you just didn't make it? It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, honestly, in my head, the, the answer to that is underachieved, but I don't mean that in a way like I'm satisfied and I'm proud of myself. But, you know, I always I, I had the privilege to dream really big, you know, and I pushed really hard and I thought and I, I had this very traumatic injury, you know, and so uh, I think that relative and, and I also had history weighing me down. And I read about this very honestly in the book. I mean, my family's history, my dad's presence as such a important and formative person in the basketball world, certainly in the Jewish sports world, th those were pressures that I didn't always deal with as well as I could have. So I'll give myself a lot of credit for what I accomplished. I was the MVP of the Maccabee Games. We won a gold medal. I'm very proud of that. You know, I was an all-conference player at Stanford. I was this close to the NBA, and I had a very successful professional career. I think that if I was not, I, I'll, I want to say if I wasn't burdened, but, but it's hard to call it a burden. But if I wasn't weighed down by some of the history that, that I was dealing with, I think I probably could have taken it a little bit higher, but I wouldn't change anything because it's my path. And, and I write about this in the book very honestly too. You know, at, there's points in your life where you think that your worth is determined by what you accomplish on a sporting field or a basketball court, but it's not the case. My family loves me and is proud of me for who I am and for what I gave to my career. And 
again, I write this in the book. When, when I retired, I told my dad, you know, I'm done. I hadn't retired yet, but I knew it was my last year. I knew early in that year, I said, I I'm done. I, I just have nothing left. And he said, the, I, you know, I didn't know what he would say to that. But the first thing he said is that, you know, not many people could have overcome that knee injury the way you did and had the career you did, you know? So it's, it, it, my family is proud of me and loves me regardless. And I'm proud of myself too for, for what I accomplished. That's right. You got that right. Your life will never be defined by what you did on a basketball court. So you got that totally right. So my mom never talked about the Holocaust very rarely until she passed away. When do you first remember learning about your grandparents' story? Did, and did they ever talk to you about it? You find with Holocaust survivors, survivors, it's often a binary. Either they don't talk about it or they want to. You know, they want to kind of transmit the history. And my grandmother is in the latter camp. My grandfather, unfortunately, passed away when I was two years old. So we, we never got the chance to develop the type of relationship that me and my grandma did. By all accounts, he was willing to talk about it. But I always had a sense of, of that something happened. You know, my family's very open. My grandmother has a very thick accent, you know, from a Hungar Hungarian accent. You hear stories about family members who are no longer with us. It's, and, you know, kids are intuitive and perceptive. You know, you pick things up. And so I, I knew from a very early age that something bad had happened. And as I got older and matured, they were kind of more candid about some of those details. And honestly, I, I never knew the extent of much of it until I took the year and a half to double click on everything, to pull every thread. I'm lucky that my grandmother has this incredible memory. She was, you know, she told me stories. Some of them are, you know, very hard things to talk about. Again, some of them were very happy, but uh, throughout the course of her life, but pertaining to the Holocaust. Yeah, I, I, I was always aware and it was always something that my grandma wanted to talk about. And I'll tell you why, because I think this is really interesting. I mean, interesting, important. She wanted to, she's always told me that she was afraid that no one would ever know that her family members existed, you know, because they were just sent to Auschwitz and never heard from again. And so, you know, now I could hold up my book and say that they live in this book, which is true. You know, their stories are told in here. Um, so for her telling their stories to, to remember them, but also to share the history so that it doesn't happen again, you know, and not just to Jews, to anybody, because they're, because we've seen what happens when people don't stand up when others aren't treated fairly, right? We needed voices at one point in time and there weren't enough of them. And so we need to stand up for ourselves. We need to stand up for each other in the Jewish community, but we also have to stand up for other communities who are not being treated fairly. And so for all those reasons, I think my grandmother wanted to talk about it. Very interesting. So the true story of your family's journey seems like Hollywood movie type stuff, but there was a real life Hollywood twist in the book. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, so after the Holocaust, right, and uh, my family spent, you know, more than a decade under communism in Romania, and my grandma still talks about that brutality and what it was like, and, you know, there was no freedom, there was no opportunity to build a life, and so very hard. In order to live, you had to do things on the black market to be able to survive, and my grandfather was very industrious and by all accounts was very good at that, and so over about 10 years, you know, transacting on the black market, they were able to save up roughly a thousand dollars worth of Romanian money and 4,000 American dollars, which they had friends who were jailed, tortured, or killed for having that much illegal money. But, you know, my grandparents had chutzpah. There's no other way to say it. You know, they, they, they wanted to build a life. They had saved this money. And when they had passed visas to, to leave Romania, they couldn't take anything of value with them. I mean, nothing, not even their silverware. So of course, and they, they weren't able to possess this money in the first place, right? Let alone smuggle it out of communist Romania. Mm -hmm. But they said, we're, we're survivors, we're getting our money out. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how they got both, their, both the Romanian and the American money out. And the American one is where there's a Hollywood twist. So for the Romanian money, my grandfather hatched a plan. He was pretty well connected around town. And so uh, the net, he asked around until he found out what train would take the family out of Romania to Rome. And so the night before they left, pitch black with a friend on, serving as watch, he walked to the train station. He shimmied his way onto the train with the Romanian money in his pocket. He found a seat at the front of the train. He stuck the wad of money as deep under it as he could, disembarked, went home. No one saw a thing. The next morning when they boarded the train, my grandmother still talks about the communist officers patting down my eight-year-old dad and screaming at him and the rest of the family, do you have anything with you? Do you have any money? 
and they said, we don't have any money with us. They weren't completely lying because it was already on board. And so uh, they, you know, they took, they took the train to Rome. They disembarked. My grandfather took that money off. And so, you know, the communist officers never knew about it. So that was the Romanian money. The American dollars were much more dangerous and there were much more of them. And that's where the Hollywood twist comes in. They couldn't figure out for the life of them, how are we going to get this money out, right? It's impossible. My grandmother had a cousin who was also a Holocaust survivor who lived in Budapest and he was a production assistant on a movie set. The biggest star of that movie was Buddy Hackett. Buddy Hackett is one of the great American comedians of all time. He was on The Tonight Show roughly 80 times up to that point. My grandparents said, well, listen, if there's ever time to ask for a favor, it's now. So they told, they asked my grandmother's cousin, hey, will you approach Buddy Hackett and see if he's willing to take our money out for us and send it to my, to my grandmother's brother in the Bronx? And he didn't hesitate. He said, if you can find out how to get the money from Romania to Budapest, I'll take it back for you. How they got it to, to Budapest is a whole different story. My grandma had to sew a false bottom into a suitcase and they had to transport it. And, there's, and this is all in the book. They got the money to Buddy Hackett. He took it back to America. He sent it to my great uncle in the Bronx with an extra $50 on top with a note that said, good luck in America, sincerely, Buddy Hackett. And that was the money that my, parents, my grandparents used when they came to America to start their life. And as a footnote to that story, about 20 years later, my grandparents, after they kind of made good in America, my dad's this big basketball star, they were vacationing in Las Vegas, they saw Buddy Hackett perform, and my grandma told the story at dinner, one of her friends excused himself, talked his way up to Buddy Hackett's suite, told him, those Holocaust survivors you helped are here, their son is a basketball star, he knew who Ernie Grunfeld was, and he said, invite him up, and so they spent the night in his suite, you know, drinking fine liquor and reminiscing, and so... I, it's really a story of worlds colliding in many ways. Wow, that's an amazing story. So what are the biggest lessons you've learned from your dad and his parents? The biggest lessons, I mean, certainly positivity, right? And my grandma always says, it's not what happens to you in life, it's how you respond to what happens to you. And so, you know, just, just to kind of keep that in mind, keep, keep going, keep believing, have hope. Of course, what my grandparents went through is the ultimate example of that. But we all go through struggles in our life. And my grandma has been, she's such an amazing person in so many ways, but she has always made space for me to have my disappointments, right? She, no one is happier than her that what I go through will not be the same as what she went through, right? She survived the Holocaust, but, you know, I had my own struggles. And so it was always about staying hopeful, staying positive. And then the second part is just the power of hard work. You know, and that's really what my dad's basketball career was built on, my own. And it relates to my grandparents coming to America, not speaking English, losing a son. And they built a really nice life for themselves. And, they, and it, was, it was really all about work. And I can't tell you throughout the course of my career how many times my dad preached that to me. Anytime I, you know, we, there are times you don't get along with your coach or you don't get along with your teammate. And anytime I would talk to my dad about my issues, he would say, keep working, hard work. You know, if you work hard, good things will happen. And so... Really, those are the, the things that I've taken in addition to pretty much everything else, I, who I am and what I know. But those things are so paramount to my identity. And I definitely took them from my dad and my grandmother. You talked earlier about the word perseverance was a big part of the story. And that it's clear that it, that it was. So you write in your book about experience anti-Semitism in America you know, long after your family had fled from it, school and basketball. How did that affect you and how did you deal with it? Yeah, you know, anti-Semitism, even if it's not apparent to the naked eye, it's always present, you know, and I think that's the sad re reality of the world we live in. I certainly felt it over the course of my life, whether it's like microaggressions, jokes, comments, whether they're more direct incidents, you know, I, I write in the book about, you know, playing baseball with my friends growing up, which by the way, in and of itself is, is noteworthy, because I don't know when I wasn't playing basketball, and I was playing baseball, but that's a whole different story. But there was a little shed in our hometown that had the baseball equipment. And I opened up that shed and there was a white swastika on, on the inside of the door, you know, spray painted, you know, big one. And I'll never forget that. And so I think that it's something that Jews experience around the world. I always think that we need to stand up for ourselves. We need to stand together as a community. I think that's why the Maccabea games are so important. And Maccabi USA is such a powerful organization to understand what it means to be Jewish, to have pride in it also to be an ally for others, which again is something that's really important to me. And I already talked about it and talked about how 
much my grandmother has preached that, you know, because you you need to stand up when people aren't treated fairly. And so, yeah, it's 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 very it's upsetting, but it also gives you a sense of perspective to know that these this hatred, this prejudice, this intolerance, it's still out there. And that's why it's so important, again, that, that we be a very tight knit community and that we stand up for ourselves and each other. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there. I mean, the rise in anti-Semitism in the world, let alone in our own country right now, is mm -hmm. staggering. And as the generation of Holocaust survivors is rapidly passing away, sadly, and now the Holocaust deniers are starting to, to grow in leaps and bounds. So a new survey found that one in 10 Gen Zers had never heard of the Holocaust. One in 10 thought Jews had caused it. Uh, meanwhile, Europe is seeing an emergence of fascism and anti-Semitism. So what message would you have for young people who might pick up your book, um, having little or no experience with Jewish history or Holocaust education? Well, the fact that they picked up my book is a, is a, is a start, you know, because just engage with the history, you know, first of all, I'm happy they're reading my book, but really it's, you have to be exposed to it. And you can't blame some of these young folks who don't, you know, there, there aren't laws in all of our states to teach the Holocaust. Many people in other generations aren't that educated about it. So I think first and foremost, it's learning this history and knowing it. And I'll give you a great example. You know, the forward for my book was written by NBA Hall of Famer, Ray Allen. Ray Allen was recently named one of the top 75 players in NBA history. People know that he's, a, he's an icon. You know, uh, what's less known is that he was appointed to the board of the Holocaust Museum by President Obama. He saw Schindler's List in college and it moved him and it struck him so much. He said, this is not just a Jewish tragedy. This is a human tragedy. You know, we, everyone needs to know about this. And so he's really made it his mission to educate people on the Holocaust. And every time his teams in Washington D played in Washington, D.C., he'd take teammates to the museum. He's visited Auschwitz. And so, you know, it, it kind of just shows the power of, of making people aware of this event in history. So again, if they read my book, they'll know about the Holocaust. And they'll also have, faces and names because at this point in history it's almost an abstraction it's it's six million jews and millions more it's it's almost impossible for people to get their minds around but i've been telling a lot of groups as i've been speaking about my book you know it wasn't that long ago and it wasn't that far away and so many people particularly this younger generation maybe they're not jewish or don't know jewish people they've never met a holocaust survivor but if they read my book they'll know my grandmother you know so that that's a start right there you know just to know the history so you, you spent all this emotional energy in writing this book, months and months and research. And now that you've written it, what are you hoping pe people take away from this book? Well, what we just talked about, particularly for the younger generation, as you know, a tool to educate. You know, I've always said that the wrapper of this story is basketball. So I hope young folks will engage with it because it's a fun and funny and you know, exciting story. But there is this really deep and important history. So that's one piece. But you know, ultimately, there's a lot of darkness in this family story, but there's much more light. There really is. And so I hope that people who read it have the sense of hope and inspiration that I've always felt through the course of my life, just knowing this story and knowing people who went through so much, who overcame so much, who achieved so much, not just as basketball players, but as people, you know, how they love their families and how they've been in the communities. And so, yeah, I hope that that people read the book, are inspired by it, are entertained by it, but really have, have a feeling of hope from it. So when I wrote my book, Dan, I wrote it very episodically. I really didn't know where it was going. And then one chapter was an epiphany and tied the whole meaning of my whole story together. When you went into writing your book, how did you, was it the same way you were looking at episodic things and something might have tied it together? Yeah, I mean, in a, in a sense, I had an I had an idea of you know I knew the the bones and what the components would be and where I ultimately wanted to go. You know, it's like a journey. You know your destination, but how you're going to get there, it, it it remains to be seen. And that certainly happened in the writing process. So much iteration, so much tinkering and modifying, and there were definitely aha moments throughout the book where I would write something. I'd be like, oh, this connects to something that happened 50 years in the future. And I would do research and, you know, I learned a lot, you know, you'll, for those who read the book, and I hope some of you will, there are a ton of connections of places in history, people in history. I mean, Richard Nixon, the Beatles, you know, I mentioned Raul Wallenberg, Adolf Eichmann, you know, just, you know, Buddy Hackett, we talked about, there's a lot of people kind of weaving in and out of this story. 
some of that was stories I had heard from my family, but some of it was me connecting dots that happened throughout the writing process. You know, so it was, I, I would say my experience was very similar to yours. I had my eye on a destination, but how I got there, it, I, I didn't know, but I do think I got there at the end of the day. That's great. So um, although the book just came out, have you ever even thought about writing another one down the road? Wow. So there'll never be another one like this. You know, there can't be. This is, this is the one, this is my, again, without being hyperbolic, this is my soul on a page. You know, it really is. It's my story, my family story. You, but I love to write and I love to tell stories. And certainly there are other stories in my life that are meaningful and, and other things I like to tell. So yeah, I do, I do hope one day to, to continue writing, to write another one. But yeah, there's only one of these. Where can we get a copy of your book? What's the best, the easiest way? Amazon.com is the easiest way. I'm, you know, I'm proud to say that it's sold out at local bookstores, which is a, a good thing because people are interested. But I, I, we want to support local bookstores because it's really important. But yeah, it's sold out at local bookstores. So Amazon, it'll, it'll get to you. Uh, they have a big shipment there. So uh, yeah, I hope some of you will, will uh, read the story and engage with it. So you can't have an interview in the president's form without a little bit of Jewish guilt. Are you ever thinking about getting involved with Maccabi USA in the future? Thank you for this. I'm really, I'm happy. We're, uh, listen, I, honestly, I'm involved with Maccabi USA today because I'm, I'm doing this panel. I'm still have close relationships with the organization. I have lifelong friends that I met through Maccabi USA. So there won't be a time in my life where I'm not involved. And I think, and honestly, you all don't even know that I, I talk to some Jewish athletes who have reached out to me. And that's the first thing I tell them is play, go play in the Maccabee games, play in local Maccabees things, because it's, it's so meaningful and important. And so, uh, yeah, I, I consider myself always a, a friend of the program, part of the family, and that will continue. Yep. It's, it's an important part of my life. That's great to hear. So Dan, thanks for this wonderful interview. I think now we have a very enthusiastic group here tonight. I'd like to open it up for some Q&A. And it's never that easy with the, we have three different screens here. So if someone would like to ask some questions, now is the time to unmute yourself and wave to me and I'll call on you. We also have, I think in the chat, chat yeah, drop right. questions. Um, so it's, my eyes aren't very good. So I don't know if you want to see me up close and personal like that, but if someone right. can maybe feed those questions. I found one that I didn't ask. What was the process to get Romanian citizenship to play for the national team? Did your family have any hesitations for you to do this? It's a great question. Um, no hesitations. I, I did, you know, it was, it was helpful for me with, in my European career. Um, it took six months to get my dad's birth certificate from Sutmar, Romania. I mean, it, it just, it took forever. And I read about it in the book and there's some funny stories around it. Um, it, it was a process. It, it took, I think a year and a half, two years, but by, by the end of it, uh, for me to get the citizenship, it helped me in my European career because I could because they were part of the European Union, so I could count as a European for certain quotas and leagues around the world. Uh, my stint with the Romanian national team was short lived, and again, I write about that with you know a good deal of humor that I wasn't expecting some of the conditions that I encountered. One of them being that our center forgot his shoes to one of our first games, and it just seemed okay with everyone and. Uh, there's more. Uh, I'll let you read the book to, to learn about some of that. But yeah, it, it, listen, my family didn't leave Romania under good terms, right? They, they fled. And so, and I actually referenced this in the book as well. And my dad was an Olympian in 76. Nadia Comaneci, you know, had her perfect tens. And, and um, you know, I asked him, did, did you feel, and she's Romanian. And I said, did you feel kind of a kinship and connection to her? And he said, I didn't at that point in time. I was an American and we had fled mm -hmm. Romania and I had found basketball and I was now, you know, a citizen of the United States of America. And so, you know, there was some, some complicated history there, but ultimately it's where we come from. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to go back in certain ways and kind of tie the history together a bit. Thanks, Dan. So I'm looking here for any new questions. Anyone want to raise their hand, ask a question, now's your time. So let's um, Roy Solomon. And a little early good and wealthy, or Roy just celebrated a big birthday. Happy birthday, Roy. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, yeah, uh, Jeff, that was a fantastic interview, I have to tell you. Uh, Dan, uh, I, I've been involved in Maccabi uh, since 1969. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm 85 years old. Uh, I'm really proud 
to see you as a member of Maccabi. Uh, the interview was great. Everything you had to say. I wish you could speak to some of the people in my age group living in the USA who don't have that real feeling of their Judaism, their pride. <laughs> And in speaking to some of them, I have to tell you, with my Israeli flag in the background, they were shocked when they actually saw that flag. You carry such a sense of pride about your Jewishness, about Maccabi, that it was really a pleasure listening to you. Right. Thank you for saying that. Happy birthday. Uh, I appreciate Thank it. You. My son's name is Solomon. So it's, it's uh, yeah, named I after my great grandfather. I appreciate you naming him after me. I really do. <laughs> listen, with that flag in the background, it's just working for me. So, no, listen, thank you for that comment. I, I'm really grateful. And uh, yeah, the, the organization means a lot to me. And certainly I, I am proud of my Judaism. So I, I appreciate it. Any stories um, relating to the relationship between your dad and Bernard King? Bernie and Ernie? Ernie and Bernie? Yeah. It's funny. People say, is it Ernie or Bernie or Bernie and Ernie? So <laughs> In Knoxville, you know, my dad was a year older. It's called the Ernie and Bernie show. But of course, Bernard was such a better pro that people say Bernie and Ernie. And for those who aren't aware, my dad teamed up with Bernard King, you know, an NBA Hall of Famer at Tennessee. They're one of the greatest duos in college basketball history. So my dad and my mom were visiting me and my wife in the Bay Area about a month ago. And, you know, we were just hanging out and my dad stepped out for about a half hour. And when he came back in, we said, hey, man, where'd you go? And he said, oh, that was B. Bernard had just called them. Uh, they still talk once a month. You know, Bernard was a black man from Brooklyn. My dad's a white immigrant from Queens. They go down to Knoxville and they become legends together. And so, and they played together in the NBA for the Knicks, by the way. So Bernard lived up the street from us. And so, yeah, it, it's, this also kind of speaks to basketball and, and the power of the game. We always say, my family, the ball, it doesn't know what country you come from. It doesn't know what language you speak. It doesn't know what color is, your skin is, what religion you are. It doesn't care. It just brings people together. And sports bring us together. This, you know, Maccabi USA is a great example of it. And so my dad and Bernard, that's that narrative, you know, and they made a 30 for 30 ESPN did about those two guys. It's called Bernie and Ernie. If anyone wants to check it out, it's really awesome. But listen, if you won't hear one basketball player talk more effusively about another than my dad talking about Bernard King. I mean, he, he says, Dan, like, you, you don't know. I mean, Bernard led the NBA in scoring, you know, and uh, my dad has such great respect and, and for him and pride in what he did. And yeah, that's, it, it's, it's a tremendous relationship to this day. And actually, I'll tell you one funny little story. My dad says that when they were senior, you know, when my dad was a senior at Tennessee, Bernard was a junior, you know, they each had averaged 25 points per game in the same year. They were co-SEC player of the year. And my dad said that NBA scouts were coming down and he learned this after the fact from his college coach and NBA scouts were saying to his college coach, man, well, Bernard's really good, but oh, Ernie's really good too. I mean, I don't think you could go wrong, you know, and, and uh, you know, as a rookie, my dad averaged six and a half points per game and I think two or three rebounds and Bernard King averaged 24 points per game and nine rebounds. So very quickly, like at the next level, Bernard's greatness shined through. But uh, yeah, I mean, my dad says, Dan, like, you don't know how great this guy was. You don't know. So, and, and, and also a very interesting part is he says, he was a great teammate. So usually when someone's such a superstar, it's really about them. But those two guys were both superstars, but they made each other better. I think that's why, you know, they were such a phenomenon together. Thanks, Dan. One of the questions in the queue is from Marshall Einhorn. Did you ever travel back to Europe with your grandma and or your dad? Not with my grandma, uh, but with my dad, yes. We've, first of all, Israel, I, my, my whole family came to watch us win gold in the Maccabee games in 2009. And that was such a profound moment for our family. My sister and I both, that was our first time in Israel. We both consider it life-changing. I said to her there, I'm going to finish my career here. And that's what I did. Um, and so for us to be able to be in Israel together to watch me win gold, again, write about this in great detail in the book, really, really special experience. My dad would be scouting in Europe a lot when I was playing. So he would come, he watched me play in Germany. And actually the game he came to in Germany, I told him that I had met a girl who's now my wife, you know, um, and I, again, this is detailed in the book. He came in Spain when I won a championship. He was there for the game that we won the championship. And so we were able to, and we also traveled a bit in Europe together and, uh, you know, saw games. And my dad is a big history buff. And so we'd always visit these castles and 
you know, tour guides would tell us about the history and he would correct them and he'd usually be right. He knows a lot about it. He really knows a lot about history, but we never went back to Romania. You know, he, he's never been back. We never went back together, but we certainly have been to Europe and Israel together. Thanks, Dan. Jed had a question. Yes. First of all, Dan, great job. Wonderful interview and good luck with the book. I feel kind of privileged because I played with Ernie in 1973 at the Maccabea. And of course, I got to watch you play uh, in the Maccabea a few years later on. So congratulations on everything. I wanted to share with this group, since I see a lot of familiar faces and it feels like family, that uh, to come full circle with many of the discussions that we're about to announce through the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame that your father, Ernie, is going to be inducted next July, just before the Maccabee game. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Jed. First of all, it's great to see you. Um, you're, you're a friend, so it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's wonder, a wonderful honor. I know he's very grateful, as am I. I mean, that's, that means a lot. That really means a lot. And thank you for announcing it to this group. And thank you for coming today. I remember you know, see, us spending time together in 2009 and my dad mm -hmm. talking about your time together in 73. Jen, were you, are you lefty? Very lefty. <laughs> see, I, my dad, and I remember my dad said, Jen, Jen could play. Jen was a left. So I, my dad told me about your game. So uh, he had a lot of respect for you as a player and as a person. But uh, thank you for sharing that with the group. Right. Thanks, Jed. Uh, Mazel tough, Dan, on that. Um, we're going to do some, anyone want to open their mic and ask a question? Now is your time. Uh, Steve here. I just, I, I put in the chat, but I, it's not a question, but just uh, ironically, um, Ray Allen held the three point record, the all time three point record until tonight, and Steph Curry broke it at the garden. There you go. In the first quarter. In the first quarter. Thank you for that announcement because, you know, he was too short and, you know, they had this nationally televised game at the garden. So uh, I was so focused on this that I, it wasn't even in the back of my mind. But now that you say it, like I was, I was tracking it. So Steph, Steph holds the record from Ray. Maybe I should. Uh, Ray's name is on the book. I'll, I'll call Steph and see if for the next version we could, uh, you know, upgrade it, right? <laughs> Anyone else have a question or something I want to say to Dan? Okay. I so... do. I do. Go ahead, Danny. Hi. Hi, Jed. How are you? Hi there. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Danny Hakim. I'm actually calling from Israel. It's nearly four o'clock in the morning. I really appreciate uh, everything you said, Dan. Uh, I can't wait to get a copy of your book. I'm on the board of Maccabi World Union, and I'm also putting together a coalition of sports for peace and social change here in Israel. And at the moment, we've got uh, 10 uh, leading organizations, including two basketball uh, organizations, one called Peace Players, and the other one called the Hoops for Peace, which is an Arab organization. And we're putting it together. And within just the coalition, we have 25,000 kids, Jewish and Arab. And it's going to be really quite a, a powerful source uh, for social change. I'd like to know from you, Dan, you mentioned about uh, the values of tolerance and being positive. How can basketball, in your eyes, be used to create peace more in our little country here? Yeah. Well, Danny, first of all, thank you for staying up or being up for this. Uh, so Peace Players International is an organization that means a lot to me. I volunteered for them when I was playing in Jerusalem. Actually, on my book website, which is just dangruntfeld.com, there is a page where you can donate copies of my book to Peace Players. So uh, they're, yeah, for, for many reasons, they're an important organization to me. I applaud you for the work you're doing. I think that they're, they're the evidence, right? Using basketball as a tool to build bridges in areas of conflict. And there's such great understanding that can be achieved through basketball. And I've been to a, I'll continue to use Peace Players as an example. I've been to one of their practices where you had Israeli girls and you had Palestinian girls playing with and against each other, communicating with each other, learning about each other and enjoying the game together. You know, because I, I say as as many differences as we have, there's always more similarities, you know, and so the love of the game can really illuminate that. And so basket, basketball sports in general are such a powerful cultural tool. Again, Maccabi USA is such a good example of that. Uh, so, I, again, the, the work you're doing is tremendous. And there are, in my opinion, few tools as powerful as sports. 
and it relates to the comment that I made previously where it doesn't matter where you're from or or what you believe in when you're on the field or on the court we're all equals you know what I mean so I think that yeah I I think what you're doing is wonderful and I think the more of it that there is in the world the better because it can really bring people together hey Jeff yes Ron well I think some of you should know about Ernie Grunfeld's first experience with the Maccabea it was 1989 and we started a um a master's basketball program for those over the age of 35 in order to continue the program. And I was chairman of that project at that time. And I was fortunate enough to have as my coach, a guy who was too young to play for that team because he wasn't 35 yet. He was Ernie Grunfeld. And he <laughs> brought with him his assistant coach who was his coach in high school um, Erwin, Erwin, I can't think of his last Irwin name. Erwin Iser. Erwin Iser, right. And we just had a wonderful time. And I think, I think uh, Ernie's involvement with the Maccabea was, uh, at that point, was a very important point of his life. And obviously yours also, uh, Dan. And thank you very much for this wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ron. It's good to see you. I remember the time we spent, I think you were in Philly for our training camp for 2009. And then afterwards as well so you've been a good friend Billy I've been everywhere for training camps I've been everywhere for tryouts I've been, yeah he's yeah. been yeah. here yeah. before we even had so training recently. camps <laughs> so hey, Bruce you had a question sure as a, as a kid growing up in New York uh I, I looked up to uh, Ernie Grunfeld you know as a as a basketball player as a Jewish basketball player and uh, this is the second time I've seen you Dan you uh you were on the Arts, Books, and Cultural Festival here in Cherry Hill um, about a month ago, and yep. my wife and I uh, just enjoyed your talks so very much. And I hope that you keep talking about this story because we we want it to continue. We want people to know. We want people to, you know, keep keep the story of the Holocaust alive. And uh, your story is just just what can I say? Just it's over and over again. Please share it. We already have your book. We're about to start reading it. And thanks for everything you've done. Bruce, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very grateful. And thank you for engaging with the story as well, man. But I, I will continue to tell it. And, you know, please spread the word. Tell, tell your friends. I, I've learned about it. It's you not know, even books, right? Yeah. It's story. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, I'm, a, I'm a trainer and a physical therapist. And I was curious. I'm, I'm actually at home rehabbing a knee replacement from, from, from all my years of playing sports. But what was your knee injury you had there at Stanford? It was a torn ACL. Yeah, I figured that. Okay. Yeah. And I know the knee replacement is a painful one. So I wish you good luck with your recovery. <laughs> this is this is not a fun two weeks. Yeah. But thank you again, Dan. You're fabulous. Fabulous. No, appreciate you, man. Thank you. And and the story about your grandmother is just buddy hack. It just amazing. Can't wait to read the book. I, I was gonna say, wait till you read the book. I please reach out, you know. Uh would love to keep in touch and hear your your uh opinions of it, but I, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. So any other questions for Dan? Great job, on? Jeffrey. Thanks. Great job. So Dan, I just want to say that, um, that you were a breath of fresh air. Uh, you have a great you. story. Your candor and insightfulness is so appreciated. And uh, I really look forward to reading this book. And I just want to say thank you for this hour. And I want to leave the last word for you. Is there anything you'd like to say as you say goodbye to us? Yeah, first and foremost, thank you. So thank you to Jeff, Marshall, Steve and the whole, the whole Maccabi USA family who has you know, given me this opportunity to share the story. I'm very grateful. So thank you for that. Thanks to everyone who came tonight. I mean, I know we all have a lot to do and to spend an evening hearing me talk about this story uh, really means a lot. And I think I'll just reiterate what I said before that despite the darkness in the story, there's more light and it's hopeful and inspirational. And I hope some of you will, uh, will pick up a copy, read it and tell your friends about it. That way we can continue to transmit the history because it is an important one. Thanks again, Dan. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope to see you soon. Thank you, Steve Graber, for helping put this together. And a big thank you to Dan Grunfeld. And I hope to see you down the road. Thanks a lot. Likewise. Thank you, Dan.